Good morning, everybody. I'm Bill Hanlett, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Monday, April 10th, 2023. Good to have you on board. Today is show, today's show is brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. Since 1873, now 150 years, the members of the Naval Institute have provided the open forum of proceedings to foster debate about how to make the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard better. If you enjoy the show, ring the bell, subscribe, recommend us to your friends, and become a member of the Naval Institute at usni.org forward slash join. Now let's get to our guests. Retired Navy Captain Jim Bryant is joining us from California, and Stephen Walsh is here with us today from New Hampshire. It is a sad Naval anniversary today. 60 years ago today, the USS Thresher, SSN 593, was lost at sea with all hands during a sea trials deep dive test off the coast of Massachusetts. Jim and Steve and three others are the authors of an article in the April proceedings titled, Was the Thresher Ready for Sea? Steve, Jim, thanks for being on the show. You're welcome, Bill. Great to be here. Uh, so, yeah, I'm gonna start just by, because uh, both of you and, and your co-authors are very connected to this. Uh, so starting with Jim, Tell our listeners your connection to the Thresher and, um, you know, the, the efforts that you've made over the years to, uh, you know, to, to do right by the victims of the Thresher loss. Well, my association with the Thresher goes back to, uh, I was chief engineer of Lucy's S. Grant, which had basically the same engine room that Thresher did. It was a missile su submarine, but it had the same propulsion plant, same layout of the engine room. Then I went on to serve uh, on uh, three other Thresher class submarines, uh, uh, Permit, uh, Haddock, and then Commanded Guardfish. And I always would, walking around the engineering space, look up and say, which one of these pipes would have broken uh, that caused the problem on, on Thresher back when we thought that it was flooding? And then uh, I made friends with a, with a guy named uh, Bruce Rule, who was the acoustic expert that analyzed uh, the acoustic recordings of Thresher's last dive, which a lot of the results of the Court of Inquiry come from. And uh, he eventually decided that he was going to write a tell-all book and release the information that was still technically secret, uh, you know, back in about 2017. That, uh, and that, and that encouraged me to start studying Thresher. Gotcha. Stephen, how about you? Yeah, Bill, I was born and raised in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. <clears throat> My father worked at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. And the first submarine I ever saw, in fact, the first ship I ever saw get launched was Thresher. Um, growing up in Portsmouth, I subsequently, uh, after Thresher was lost, uh, started having classmates who lost their dads on Thresher. And then it's subsequently, I started working at uh, Portsmouth Naval Shipyard myself as an engineer, naval architect. And then later on, I transferred down to NAVC. So my personal and professional career path just keeps intertwining with Thresher. And then later on, uh, Bruce Rule hooked me up with Jim. And uh, uh, that's how I basically have gotten as involved in it as I have been. Uh, so early in my career, just uh, the connection with Bruce Rule continues. Uh, I, I worked at ONI, the Office of Naval Intelligence, and I did some work with uh, the submarine group there. And Bruce was, he was considered, you know, he was like the God of acoustics intelligence. Uh, he was, you know, there were, there were lots of people who were studying to be, you know, a, a, acoustics, acint, acoustics, intelligence experts, both civilians and, um, uh, and, and Navy um, uh, sonar men. Right. And, and Bruce was like, he was the godfather to all of them. So when I started reading the work that you were doing, and I saw Bruce's name, it was, uh, you know, it was really no surprise that he was uh, interconnected, intertwined with this story. So uh, for our listeners who may not know what happened to Thresher that day, uh, Jim, just give a, you know, a quick two minutes on um, what the <laughs> submarine, yeah, well, I know it's a, it's a complicated story, so we'll, we'll, yes. we'll pull it out, but, but just, you know, the, the, the quick, you know, uh, Reader's Digest version of what happened to the submarine that day. Yes, Bill. Norman Pullman and I were actually talking on the phone yesterday about, about this very complex story. 
I mentioned earlier, I used to look up at, at the piping um, when I served on those class submarines about where, where the water would have come from. That's what the board thought happened. They thought the submarine had a major flooding in the engine room. And that is just not, not true. Uh, there's, there's no acoustic data to, to support that. Uh, the, the, the basic easy, easy one is that pressure lost propulsion. The main propulsion that could drive the submarine to the surface what was lost. Uh, and, and, and there's a, a, a myriad of things you can say about, about how that was lost. But, uh, and she was very heavy. We think about 20,000 pounds heavy from our, our studies. And she sank and uh, the sea pressure crushed her. That, that's the short version. Got it. So not necessarily a, a, a pipe leak or something like that. So, so she was going down, she was doing deep dive tests after coming out of the yards. Uh, so, and the deep dive test, the goal was to get her down to what, about 1300 feet? Yes, and, and uh, that's what everybody says. I can't say that because the Navy reclassified that depth. So the Norman Polamar and Dr. Friedman say it's 1300 feet. So that's the depth. Uh, Got it. Yes, Got because it. the only way you can test a submarine when you when you've done hull work is to take it down to its test depth to, to make sure that the that the uh, the hull is sound. So she comes out of Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. She was built there. Uh, she had done some sea trials. She'd gone back in for some additional work, and now she's got to go out and do her uh, her test depth dive. Um, she's accompanied by a, um, uh, a submarine tender or, a, you know, a, a surface vessel that's there to, um, you know, support uh, the, the, the sea trials. Uh, and, and she, you know, makes a couple of dives. Uh, and then on this one, she goes all the way to 1300 feet. And, and as you point out, um, she, the, the, the assumption now or the, the conclusion now that you've made is that uh, she had a reactor scram problem and that because of that, didn't have the speed and the ability to essentially drive herself back to the surface, right? So, uh, you know, let's let's just pull a few more of the details out of that. So, um, what what made you think uh, that the uh, conclusions early on, the 1960s conclusion that she had had some sort of uh, uh, plumbing failure, if you will, or piping failure, was was incorrect? Well, there was no acoustic record of it. The uh, the Skylark uh, the submarine rescue vessel Skylark Skylark had an underwater telephone, and through that speaker, the underwater telephone, they 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 picked up a, a main ballast tank below air rushing into a ballast tank, and they 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 picked up the hull collapse. They heard that if there had been six hundred pound seven hundred pound water rushing in through a two to a five inch hole as the board thought so, you would have heard that. On, and, and the Celsius recording, the sensor that recorded the acoustic uh, uh, sounds of pressure on, on her last dive did not have the resonant uh, lines on it that you would expect from uh, major flooding. And, and Bruce Rule had seen this before. He'd seen this in other, other submarine incidents, and he did not see that on, on, on pressure. So the, you, you mentioned SOSIS, so the Sound Surveillance Undersea System, um, and, and which was laid down during the Cold War, largely to, uh, to detect Soviet submarines uh, in the Atlantic and be able to you know, uh, it, find those uh, submarines when they came across the GIUK gap and other places. Uh, Bruce L Rule, as you, you mentioned, was one of those acoustics intelligence experts who would listen to and be able to, you know, you classify. Listen. What's that? You couldn't listen. You, but you, you can't listen. Was, you're, you're on a paper gram. You're, you're watching the waterfall gram, graphs, stylus, right? yeah, electrosensitive yeah. paper, and we're going too too far into the weeds. But no, you it didn't hear anything. Okay, so you're you're watching those waterfall graphs and yep. and looking at the sound profiles, and then classifying submarines or classifying things that are happening on submarines by those sound profiles. Uh, so the, talk a little bit about the first, the Court of Inquiry and what was released to the public back in the 1960s. And then also what was kept, what was kept secret for a, a long time? The majority was kept secret until my lawsuit, my 2019 lawsuit 
there was only 19 pages of testimony and there were 1700 pages of testimony and which really tell the story. And what was, what was released was, was fairly heavy, heavily redacted. So now we have all 1700 pages of testimony that basically tell us that the Navy did not understand the inherent danger of almost doubling the test depth of the submarine. They're going from 700 foot boats, uh, which were built after World War II, to thresher using a stronger steel, and, they, and everything from procedures to the quality control to the material they used, you know, as, as Steve has always pointed out to me, is that all they did was take a diesel boat system, a piping system, a pumping system, and increase the wall size to make it stronger, not even thinking about, well, maybe if this going really this deep, maybe we ought to look at the whole redesign of the system. Got it. Uh, Steve, uh, over to you. you. You mentioned you're a naval architect. Uh, so did, did you work on submarines uh, during your career, both at, at NAVSEA and, and, at, and at Portsmouth? And how did, how did the Thresher, <clears throat> what happened on Thresher, impact your career as a naval architect? Um, I had the, um, the pleasure of working with some of the guys that designed Thresher at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. And um, uh, they were devastated. The shipyard was absolutely devastated. Not only did they, uh, they lose the crew, uh, many of which were fellow co-workers, shipyard riders, but also um, a lot of the Thresher uh, families were um, members of the community because th uh, Portsmouth Naval Shipyard was the only home port Thresher ever had in its short existence. So there was a very concerted effort to uh, make sure we never replicated some of the things that uh, we learned as a result of the post-mortem, if you would, of the loss of that ship. Uh, so there was a lot of attention, you know, the sub submarine safety program, SubSafe for short, came out of that. And Portsmouth was very, very uh, adamant about following that. They never wanted to have something like that happen again. But... Um, I used to, to answer your question, I used to be a shipyard writer. I would go out to sea four or five times a year. And uh, Thresher was pretty much on my mind when uh, when I'd be out to sea myself. So I, I would imagine it would be, you know, you get underway on a submarine, you, uh, you make a dive and you're thinking about, uh, you know, what you saw as a child. You said, you said that the, the, the children of Thresher shipmates uh, we're in your in your uh, elementary school classes, right? Yes, very true. Yep. Got it. So that's the that's uh, the the other thing to on an earlier observation that you made uh, that uh, asked Jim. When I went to NAVC, I was working in the deep submergence office, and some of my uh, cognizant programmatic cognizant assets would periodically uh, survey Thresher. And getting back to what Jim said about uh, the court of inquiry. Uh, stipulating that it probably was flooding in the engine room based on the wreckage I've seen on the bottom from some of my assets. Uh, there was no sign to me that uh, Thresher was equalizing from flooding back there. The, the pressure hull just does not look like there was any equalization. If there was, there wasn't much going on in that, in that particular compartment. So for our, our lay audience, including me, describe that a little bit more. So if there was flooding in the engine room, right, then you when, wouldn't have... When, when, a, a, when a compartment explosion. floods on a submarine, the air in that compartment starts pressurizing. Mm -hmm. It starts climbing from basically one atmosphere, which is what the submarine is, is uh, pressurized at inside the pressure hull. That, that'll start climbing. And uh, because the outside pressure, it's going to want to try to equalize. So there was very, um, if you look at the pressure hull of the engine room, Thresher basically broke apart by compartment when she imploded. So there's, uh, she basically was a five compartment ship and uh, she ended up in, in that many pieces, large pieces on the bottom. The engine room um, had a tremendous amount of, of distortion to the hull, but it was largely intact. All, most of the other uh, compartments were pretty pretty well shattered, but not the engine room. It was clear that uh, it had watertight integrity quite deep. And um, uh, had the boat been equalizing, the deformation of the hull would not have been as extensive as it is on the bottom right now. 
Um, Very, so yeah, it, that tell that told me. In fact, when I first hooked up with Bruce after I retired from NAVC in 2017, I mentioned to him that um, it didn't look to me like uh, the engine room had been equalizing. It had uh, the internal pressure had not been equalizing to the external pressure, and uh, he jumped on that immediately. Interesting. Um, so, Jim, you've talked a little bit about uh, the your lawsuit and also the Freedom of Information Act. And over the last few years, we've published a number of things in proceedings as some of that information has been forthcoming from the Navy. This, they've, they've declassified some in response to that FOIA and, and the lawsuit. Uh, so describe, if, if you would, some of the things that came out as they came out and then how that changed the conclusions about what caused the loss of the thresher? Well, the, the Navy has finally released about 4,000 pages. They, they released uh, uh, most of the 255 exhibits that support the testimony and the conclusions in the court of inquiry. Uh, but um, they've, they've in, in some cases, they've, they've heavily, heavily redacted that information, and it's hard to tell. And in some areas, they released the same information because the, the redaction team uh, is not talking to each other, or whatever, which, which is good for us because we, we need more, more information. Um, but my intention was in my lawsuit, the first thing in the lawsuit, you know, we, we, we submitted a couple of very simple Freedom of Information Act, re, Act re requests back in 2017. And they were things that we knew were unclassified, like the, 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 uh, the sea trial schedule. It says, in what has been released, that this was an unclassified document. And they very cleverly, they've got very good bureaucrats there that know how to keep things hidden. Things get passed around and became very difficult. And it looked like the only way that I was going to get information out of the Navy was, was to file a lawsuit. And that has told us, and, and listening to the testimony, there's a Commander Woolston who made a testimony. He was the, the desk officer, Steve, Yes, down he, a few was, ships. The, Bu the Bureau of Ships was the now the current NAV ships. He was the project officer for the Thresher class. And he was actually an enlisted guy on the Indianapolis when it sank and survived wow. that. But, but he, um, so he had a, a history of you know, living through surviving ships. And he was very, very brutally honest about the design. It was diesel boat designs. And that testimony was, was, was very valuable. In fact, Steve has, has copied that and passed that to a number of people. Uh, one of the things that I found interesting when I read your article is that the, uh, the procedures for a reactor um, shutdown at, at depth for the thresher were, you know, essentially that you, um, the, 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 there was not enough residual uh, steam power to drive the submarine to the surface, right? Um, and then in later in later boats, they they change the procedure because uh, if there's a if there was a shutdown, you needed to e at least have the residual uh, steam power to keep the keep the submarine moving, and you wanted to propel it with the planes uh, up to a uh, less depth, so it, you 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 came out of that danger zone. Describe that a little bit, and you know, uh, Jim, you've got you've got guard you've got your guardfish uh, guardfish hat on. Well, actually, uh, so it's, the, yeah, it's the uh, yeah. It, I, those it, are the submarines that I Thunder class submarines I served on. We called ourselves Five Ninety Four Tough because the admirals called us that because it's a very hard submarine to maintain back in the in the seventies and eighties. And you said uh, all those those submarines were were sister ships of. Uh, of yes. Thresher and Guardfish, yes. Guardfish, you commanded. So yes. I'm guessing that yes. I'm guessing that you know the procedures that you used to to run those subsequent ships uh, were different because of maybe what was learned from Thresher, correct? Yeah, the, the procedure was changed. When a reactor shuts down in a, in a submarine, it does not stop producing heat because uh, even though the fission process that produced the major amount of heat, the the uh, the, the, the fission products decaying of all this radioactivity creates heat. And also you've got the heat built up in the steam generators and the reactor coolant system. And Admiral Rickover himself, he was the director of Naval Nuclear Repulsion. And we got his testimony. 
uh, is, is said that he believes, he said that they could have saved the ship if they had not secured steam to the engine room and used that remaining latent heat, he calls it, to drive the main engine to get the submarine up high enough because they were, they, they were trying to blow the main ballast tanks to go up, but the submarine was probably going down and they needed something to counter, counter that going down, the momentum of, of going down. And, and, and so, buoyancy alone, buoyancy and alone you know, wouldn't do it. Yeah, yeah there, there, there was some reactor safety issue, I'm guessing. I don't know, we've not found that yet. Why, why they would secure steam to the engine room after a, after a scram. But that was the procedure. I, I think at the at the start you mentioned that the the, the sub was uh, was heavy. Was it, it, I'm guessing yes. it, it had to it had to be heavy to get down to that depth, right? No, you want to keep no. us. Steve, go ahead. Talk, talk about buoyancy. <laughs> no, what what uh, like you alluded to uh, earlier, Bill. The power plant and the hydrodynamic hull form of Thrusher, she could have driven herself down even if she was positively buoyant. In okay. fact, we call that a controlled deep dive. Uh, basically, what we want to see submarines do as a result of Thrusher is to actually be a little bit on the positive buoyancy side and hold themselves down with their planes with a, with a moderate amount of speed. Um, and uh, that, that puts... Uh, fail safe if they lose propulsion when they're deep like apparently thresher did um it, it's going to want to float to the surface instead of sink to the bottom like thresher was got it okay that makes sense uh for the non non-naval architect non-engineers in, uh, in the group here including me um uh there was a, a another complicating issue uh that had to do with the you know some vortices that froze up in the main ballast blow system. Can you talk about that a little bit, Steve? Yeah, the, the, uh, basically the simplest way of looking at uh, the conical strainers in the orifice plates that were in the inlet side of the um, air, air pressure, the high pressure air reducers, um, were more or less considered to be shipyard maintenance gear. Um, the shipyard didn't put them there. They came from the manufacturer with the recommendation to install them and, and they were manufactured by the, uh, the uh, equipment manufacturer. And the reason being was the, the, the manufacturer was getting a tremendous number of, of uh, uh, these reducers coming back to them for refurbishment. And a lot of it was because the shipyards, not just Portsmouth, but all of them, apparently were using uh, contaminated air. It had a lot of par particulate matter in it. And basically it was uh, that those particulates moving along at high pressure uh, were scoring the seats. They were basically sandblasting the seats. So these, these reducers would start leaking by. To try to mitigate that, the manufacturer provided orifice plates with a conical strainer that sat on the upstream side of these reducers um, to try to filter out the particulate matter, which was the purpose of the conical strainers. The, the, uh, the problem is, is it also the, in, the incorporation of that would have adversely affected the performance of that, the design performance of that system, uh, which is why it wasn't meant to go out to sea. And unfortunately, um, when Portsmouth got ready to uh, pull those off the boat, uh, the new CEO seeing, and this is all based on the testimony that Jim got released, uh, the new CEO noting that uh, uh, he had had a high attrition just in the two and a half months that he'd been on Thresher, decided he wanted to retain them and had Portsmouth break open those mechanical joints so that his crew could verify that they were still installed. And unfortunately, the, the orifice plate is a flow restrictor and the conical strainer that sat on it uh, was into the direction of the flow. And what they found out on Portsmouth sister ship Tenosa, when the Court of Inquiry mandated a pier side blow, is the, the blow system didn't perform as expected. And when they broke the system open to try to figure out why, they realized that the conical strainers on Tenosa had collapsed into the hole in the orifice plate and that it proceeded to ice over with all the moisture in the, in the air that was moving at high, you know, was expanding at high speed from the air flasks. 
and it uh, it plugged it plugged the airflow on Tenosa over solid. By t testimony, they knew that they that installation was retained. Excuse me, retained on Thresher, and uh, they figured that the same thing must have happened to her based on Bruce Rule's Sosis analysis of hearing partial blows, but they didn't last very long. That was a great explanation. I, I commend you for that because, boy, there, there's a lot to un, unpack there. But if if I could just to to, to um, restate it a little bit, so submarine is down deep, thirteen hundred feet. She was heavier than she should have been. Uh, she's got a reactor scram, uh, some sort of reactor problem. They they scram the reactor and they they stop the um, steam from going through the turbines. So the sh the ship basically comes to a a, a standstill, uh, and and then as they're trying to blow the main ballast tanks because of these strainers freezing up, the the attempts to blow the main ballast tanks are in, insufficient, incomplete. And so the submarine's heavy, it can't blow enough ballast and she sinks. Did I, did I get that just about right? That's exactly right. That must have been uh, just a, a absolutely terrifying uh, set of events to realize what kind of what was happening or to have some realization of what was happening on board the submarine. Uh, Jim, I wanna ask a question about subsafe because after Thresher, you know, one of the good things that often happens from a disaster is if it's a, an organization that can learn from mistakes is you learn um, and you put in place, um, you know, new procedures that, that prevent that disaster from happening again. And you uh, continue to serve for another, what, 20, 25 years in the submarine force. So how did Subsafe prevent another Thresher um, how did your procedures on the, you know, guardfish and other boats uh, change? And then, you know, just t tell us a little bit about uh, what Subsafe has done for the, you know, the submarine force uh, since Thresher. Well, let's go back also to 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 the uh, the commanding officer's decision to leave those trainers in. Uh, you know, before Subsafe, you know, there there was no backup to the nuclear propulsion system. If the, if the submarine got deep and heavy and lost propulsion, there was no backup to that because that blow system uh, was considered only to, to the surface of the submarine from a very shallow depth. It was not designed or tested to be blown continuously deep to save. So one of the things, the first things they did and immediately installed on all submarines was develop a 4,500 emergency blow system because what you had on Thresher was a, uh, was a, a uh, a normal blow, and they were using the, the legacy of the 3,000-pound air system that had been used on all previous sub submarines, including World War II, but they needed, more, they needed higher air pressure, so they had to have these reducers. Bad design, bad thinking, not thinking about safety. So, and then the, and these reducers were, were dying on them. They were failing, and, and then you lose your whole air system. So the commanding officer had had that problem during uh, a fast cruise where he lost a couple of these reducers. And so he, he really wanted to make sure. So you can't really criticize him no. for, 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 for doing that. Uh, but we, we basically went back and did the right thing. We redesigned, looked at all the systems and redesigned them. We had problems with the, with the control services, jamming in, in, in guide positions or service positions, which means either you broached the surface or you exceeded test depth. And so we, re, we just basically redesigned these whole systems throughout all the things we learned about diesel boats. Diesel boats went very slow. They didn't go deep. Thresher went to test depth 40 times during her, her year of operation. And that is way, way, way more than diesel boats do. Diesel boats only go down, uh, you know, World War II, you know, to avoid depth charges. But the, so the systems were all changed. And then everything inside these critical boundaries of these systems had to have certain quality control on the way they were manufactured, the material that was used to manufacture them, the way they were installed. You had to have extra paperwork to cover. When the testimony on the, the, the Navy Court of Inquiry interviewed many people to try to figure out if the, the auxiliary seawater system in the engine room had been hydrostatically tested, pressure tested. It was a, uh, it, it was a real mess. They, they kind of figured out that, yeah, it really did. But there wasn't the paperwork and the, and the certification 
and people's name signature on it to, to, to really prove that, that it was. Where now, when, when you close up a system like that and test it, you know everybody, how it was done, and who did it. So that's a, and we've only lost one other submarine. We lost the Scorpion in May of 68. Scorpion was not fully subsafe. She was limited in depth. She could own, she was a 700 foot boat. She could only go to about 300, I forget, 300 or 350. But we lost her and that was a highly likely was it was a battery problem. So it wasn't really a hydrogen leaking from the battery and exploding. So it wasn't a subsafe issue. Is that good enough, Bill? Yeah, that's that's great, uh, great comment. Uh, I, I want to ask a question about uh, leadership, but we're we're running uh, short on time, so this might be we got time for one or two more questions. But uh, you know, crisis leadership. You talked a little bit about you know decision that the CEO made, uh, and and not criticizing him for making that decision in the shipyard before uh, the the submarine went out to sea. Um, but in the you know in the immediate aftermath of losing the submarine. Uh, and realizing what what had happened, and the loss of lives on board, and then the court of inquiry, and the uh, you know the follow up decisions made. Um, any insights on crisis leadership or on leadership through what what was a catastrophe? Well, the people have looked at that. Uh, the people in the in the bridge of the Skylark claim it was the commanding officer telling them very calmly what was going on. We didn't get a lot of information. And, and the, the commanding officer, the Skylark, got, and, and during the last phases where, where they were trying to report, he kept saying, are you in control? Are you in control? Are you in control? And blocked out a lot of, a lot of communications. But uh, uh, in that kind of situation where the, the crew – First thing, the commanding, the commanding officer and the executive officer had only been on board three, three months. They had never been to sea on a fast, deep diving su submarine. Uh, you know, and nowadays, you know, commanding officers training for the course, they, they go to sea on, on the submarine and go out and do that. They, they've been on right. a skate class uh, uh, in Nautilus. And they just didn't have that, that, that kind of experience. So it's hard to say what was really happening in the control room, but they were, you know, they, they were sure, sure trying. But uh, one of the things was they felt that the crew was so good and it really was a great crew. And it, and it, but there was so little people with experience on board. How many people we figured out, Steve, Steve's the expert on, on the, Steve, please give me a short rundown on, on the qualification of the officers. Uh, Thresher went to sea. She had 13 assigned officers, Bill. 12 of them went to sea. One was ashore on an emergency medical family situation. Uh, of those 12 officers that were lost on Thresher, only four of them had been on a Thresher-class submarine before, um, and they were all on Thresher. They were leftovers. Um, during the PSA, the wardroom was very heavily poached by bupers because they needed experienced people to man other, other submarines that were in the construction phase. So of the, uh, if, if you subtract the four that had Thresher class experience from 12, you got eight. Five of those eight were on their first submarine tour ever. They were fresh from school. Wow. Um, the other three... Um, none of them had Thresher class experience. In fact, none of them even had Skipjack class experience, which would have been the next similar class. Um, the CO did have a Tullaby experience. He had been the engine on Tullaby 597. But Tullaby was a submarine that could only dive half as, half as deep, roughly, and go roughly half as fast. So the handling characteristics of that boat uh, from a ship handling perspective and from a damage control perspective, as far as time compression due to flooding, would have been totally different. So basically the training infrastructure for the Thresher class at the time was extremely limited. No shore-based trainers. Um, the classroom was strictly book learning. And one of the courts of inquiry findings was some of the documentation that Thresher had to train on was substandard. It wasn't well-written. And there's reasons for that too, but basically, the, in today's parlance, the crew was not as enabled 
to be successful on the sea trials as they could have been or probably should have been for that yeah. deep dive. Which, by That's the way, good. that was their first deep dive after uh, shock trials. So the uh, they had tried to do a deep dive after shock trials, and they had uh, uh, they determined they had a, a leak, and the boat had a limitation in depth going into the shipyard. So that was the first time they were trying to get down to 1,300 feet after the shock trials. Uh, I, I want to step back a little bit and, and just ask your thoughts on um, leadership, not on the boat itself, but Navy leadership in the wake of the uh, of the disaster. How, how did the Navy do? The CNO at the time, or Admiral Rickover, as you mentioned, was uh, chief of naval reactors. What was? How, how did they manage the situation? Well, we we initiated this new casualty procedure, um, which actually. Uh, Leaving steam after in, in the engine room after a scram was actually in place one one other submarine. It was it was on the George Washington, the first missile submarine, fleet ballistic missile submarine. So uh, naval reactors, I think, took a look at at uh, casualty control in the engineering plant to make sure that every that every injury officer the watch, the officer in charge of the, of the propulsion plant, uh, was prepared to handle that, that kind of casualty before you'd be qualified. And that requires a lot of leadership, coordinating everything that goes on during, the, uh, during a reactor scram and recovery is, is very, um, is, is very uh, important. Make sure you have the right leadership and give directions. And I think all of our training of leaders improved and uh, to make sure that we had the exercises and did the training uh, and we had the we had the shore based diving trainers that could actually simulate, you know, surfacing, uh, changing depth, having a ha having a flooding ca casualty, and people were watched during that. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, as you as you point out, you know, because of subsafe, the Navy's lost uh, one submarine since Thresher. That was Scorpion in 68. And, and it was for, for a different reason, a battery casualty, battery problem, hydrogen buildup, et cetera. Um, and, and has had an amazing safety record in the submarine force since then, as, uh, my aviator friends would say, my, you know, NATOPS is written in blood. That's Naval Aviation, yes. uh, training and operating procedures. And, um, at, you know, subsafe also, you know, clearly is written in blood. So, uh, uh, this is a, um, an anniversary that is a hard one to observe 60 years to today since uh, Thresher went down. But it uh, sounds like the Navy uh, did some, you know, very uh, not just adequate, but admirable course correction and, and uh, you know, initiated a program that called SubSafe that is, uh, you know, Kept kept our uh, our submarine sailors safe since then. I want to commend the two of you and your and your co-authors for writing this article, but also for having the tenacity to uh, to ask the questions, you know, uncomfortable questions uh, of the Navy they, through the FOIA request and then the lawsuit, um, with the goal in mind that you know uh, sunlight can be the best disinfectant. And yes. bring to light, particularly, you know, 60 years, it's been 60 years. So there's probably not a lot about a submarine that was designed, you know, more than 60 years ago that that still needs to be kept, uh, you know, secret, given that what we're what we're operating at sea today. So um, just in, as a wrap up, I'll go to Steve and then Jim, um, you know, any parting shots or uh, or saved rounds? No, um, basically, um, your Jim's observation that the. Uh, the whole uh, Navy's approach, and I mean from OPNAV all the way down to the operators, uh, including the shipyards that design and build the boats, NAVC, which is what Bew ships uh, used to be known as Bew ships. The whole uh, approach to submarine design, uh, construction, operation, maintenance, it's all changed as a result of uh, the hard lessons learned from Thresher, and it's all changed for the better. Uh, Jim, over to you. Agree. We've we've we we changed everything at that. We were we were still honoring the the, the World War II heroes and still thinking about that. Uh, Rickover did not want uh, people like uh, Gene Flucky, Medal of Honor winner for being very very brave, operating his reactor plants because he broke the rules, and he and so we 
we we learned when, when we could break the rules and when we can't. Gotcha. No, that's an important lesson to learn. And I know uh, Admiral Rickover was all about uh, not just driving technical innovation, but also the standardization uh, to make sure that it was, uh, you know, repeatable, uh, success was repeatable, and uh, that, that we didn't have problems with our nuclear reactors at sea on submarines. Uh, well, gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, so Captain Jim Bryant, Steve Walsh uh, joining us today. They are the authors of the article in the April proceedings. It's called, Was the Thresher Ready for Sea? It's a great piece. Uh, and we honor the men who died 60 years ago today uh, on the thresher off the coast of Massachusetts. Uh, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Bill. All right. Well, that wraps up another episode of the Proceedings Podcast brought to you by the Naval Institute. Uh, to become a member, go to usni.org forward slash join. Until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.